Our gospel today is Mark, and it's chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, its master needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't think this would come as a shock to really anyone because like most children, I loved parades as a kid. How about you? I love the floats, love the guys, at least in our town, with the funny hats driving around in the little cars. I love the energy of a band or a drum line as they march by. And growing up in a small Midwestern town, I even loved it when some local farm equipment dealer would just go ahead and put their giant tractors or combines in the parade. One of the things I love the most is waiting to see uh, the float for the bank my mom and grandpa worked at. My grandpa would often ride on that float and we'd grab a seat in front of his bank and anxiously wait to see him, get his attention, get him to wave to us. I I especially loved it when my grandpa's float or any other float for that matter would throw candy out to the kids. Now think about it, it's a little bit funny, right? That someone thinks it's a good idea to throw hard candy 30 feet away from an elevated moving platform. That precious candy rains down on small children like a sweet, sugary hailstorm of pain, soon followed by a knockdown, drag out fight for who can secure as much candy as possible. As I've gotten older, my new favorite thing is parades where the bar for entering the parade is so low that you have a hard time distinguishing the parade from some random guy that just happened to turn his truck down a wrong road. On a four-wheeler, want to strap some cans on the back and make a lot of noise? Sure, you're in the parade. Have an obnoxiously big truck, and you'd like to pile 10 people in the back of it while blaring some terrible music? Sure, join the parade. Have a pack of 10 to 15 energetic four or five-year-olds, grab the soundtrack from both the Frozen movies, let those kids dance around on a flatbed trailer, and you've got yourself a parade float. That right there is the exact type of energy you would find at my college's homecoming parade. Because it's just a small private school, only about a thousand students. So as you can imagine, the parade does not generate a lot of participants or a very large crowd. It lasts about five minutes and the majority of the entries can be divided into two categories. First category, is a person no one really knows, but who gave a lot of money to the school, or maybe a star athlete from 30 years ago, and they're riding in the back of a convertible. And the second category is just simply small groups walking together with a couple people in front of them holding a banner for that group. The groups may or may not be wearing matching t-shirts. Now, a few years ago when I happened to be there for homecoming and the parade was passing by, I grabbed my friend Robin and dragged her to the back of the parade and we walked along the route doing our best royal dignitary waves. Robin and I were elected Mrs. and Mr. Milligan in the year 2000 and I felt that it was our duty to honor the good people who attended homecoming with a royal wave. This is the Sunday every year where the church throws that type of parade. You can call it a ticker tape parade if you want for Jesus as we celebrate Palm Sunday. 
the original Parade for the Messiah had a little bit of that thrown together at the last minute, use whatever you got type of energy. And it's a good energy, an energy we feel when we're able to celebrate that parade in person together. When we, like the people of ancient Jerusalem, joyfully welcome Jesus, the presumed Messiah, he's entering the capital city. Finally, this Savior is going to go about doing saving. He's going to throw those Romans out. He's going to restore Israel to its former glory. There's this sense of the people. There's a sense of urgency and desperation undergirding their celebration. You know, the crowd, it's shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And we hear those words and they just sound like good old celebration to us. It seems like celebrative words used for yelling, like yelling, hooray, hooray, you the man, Jesus. It's great that you're here, hooray. But yelling Hosanna isn't yelling hooray. No, Hosanna is a prayer. It's a short and urgent plea. It means save us, we beg you. So this really isn't like any parade we know. It's not like the 4th of July parade or the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade. No, it's more like protest. It's a march in Selma. It's a Black Lives Matter protest. It's a desperate religious and political event. Scholars have said that more than likely because of the significance of the Passover weekend, that Roman rulers would have brought in extra troops to safeguard against any potential uprising. And that each morning they would show the city their strength with their own parade through the main streets, the cardo, the, the, the shops of the city, right through the main gate. Pilate and his centurions would ride into the city on the back of war horses, proclaiming the rule of Rome with their might and their dominance. But at the same time, through a smaller gate, Jesus rode into the city, not on a war horse, but on a donkey and a colt. Instead of being flanked by centurions with swords and armor, Jesus has poor fishermen, immigrants, and widows, and the sick. Instead of crowds cowering in fear, Jesus has a crowd that uses cut branches and their very clothes as his pathway. Instead of crowds full of anger directed at their occupier, Jesus has a crowd full of hope and desperation shouting, Save us now! Save us! So how is it that in one short week, the crowds can go from shouts of Hosanna, save us, to shouts of crucify him? Jesus, the source of ultimate hope, becomes the problem that needs to be stopped. I think it's very simple for us to view the story of this week from the triumphal entry to the crucifixion with a certain sense of detachment. For many of us, it's because we've simply heard this story too many times or we've hold it, heard it told in too many manipulative ways. For others, it's because there are too many years, decades, centuries, millennia separating us from the story. It's just hard to have context. We have a hard time understanding why people would act this way or believe the stories of the claims of Jesus that he makes about himself. How could these crowds celebrate this man as a prophet and as a Messiah and with one week later call for his death? We look back at the absurdities in human history and we casually congratulate ourselves saying, how could people believe those crazy things? How could people treat other human beings in this way? We look at things like the horrors of the Salem witch trials. We see the atrocity and leg legacy of slavery, the foolishness of wars over religion, and we hubristically believe that we would have never done such things. I think our detachment from the story of Jesus and his last week comes from that place. 
we just can't understand why a whole city, a whole nation who clamored for him to save would call for his death days later. We're detached because we just can't imagine behaving the way these ancient people behave. We know who Jesus is, and we would never act like this. But this story, this final week, from Palm Sunday to Good Friday, triumphal entry to crucifixion, this story is our story, and it plays out over and over again in our lives. How easy it is to give up Jesus' rule in our lives. One day we desperately call to him to save us. The next we send him away like he's the problem. One moment we realize how incapable we are of changing our lives for the better. And yet, in the next moment, we are content to simply be who we've always been. At the beginning of the week, we are challenged to be compassionate and generous with our coworkers. And by the end of the week, we're wishing them the worst. At the beginning of the week, we're challenged to confront the sin and the hold it has on our lives. But later in the week, we just feel resigned to constantly live in and with it. On Sunday, we will work to tear down the walls of racism, classism, sexism, pick an ism, any ism that would divide us. But by the time Friday rolls around, this discomfort of reckoning with our own complicity and perpetuating these isms draws us back into our isolated bubbles that look and act just like us. On Sunday, we're challenged to have compassion on the poor, to see them as human beings worthy of love and dignity. But on Friday, we're worn out from the complexities of the problem. We find it easier to write the poor off and believe the myth that they're lazy and we're not, and we've earned everything we got. At the beginning of the week, we realize the dep depravity of our being and the utter need for a savior to come and save us in every moment. But by Friday, we're three days in already to live in as functional atheists, where we claim the words of faith and yet live as though there is no God or a savior who loves us. No, we weren't the ones standing in the courtyard. We weren't in the mob. We didn't hear Pilate claim the innocence of Jesus. We weren't the ones laying down palm branches, chanting, save us, only to chant, crucify him later. But that story, those actions are our actions. That's why I think hymns like, Ah, Holy Jesus, we sometimes sing in Holy Week, are so important because they force us to grapple with the reality that this story this week is our story. Its lyrics go like this, Ah, Holy Jesus, who hast thou offended that man to judge ye hath in hate pretended by foes derided by thine own rejected, O oh, most afflicted. Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason, Jesus, hath undone thee. T'was I, Lord Jesus, I it was denied thee. I crucified thee. By our unfaithful actions, by our lack of commitment to grace, justice, and mercy, by our failure to rely on God. Moment by moment, we have participated in the crucifixion of Jesus, and yet here is Jesus, the crucified one, who identifies so completely with the message he proclaims that he refuses to relent and acquiesce to the will of those who threaten his well-being, even from us, the ones he came to save. We need a savior. Jesus, we need you. Save us from our own failures to follow you. Mend these broken vessels. Turn our world upside down this year and help us to welcome you into our lives more completely. Palm Sunday is not just a day of celebration. It's Jesus' call to come and follow him this week, wherever it leads. This is a day that we should be waving our palm branches in desperation. 
Come, Lord Jesus. Come, redeem us. Here on this Sunday, celebration and praise can exist at the same time and place with loss and grief and desperation. So we're invited to embrace the person of Jesus, to shout Hosanna, all the while we brace ourselves for the suffering of this week. The King of Kings has come to Jerusalem, a journey that will lead to betrayal and death. But the transformation from Hosanna to crucify him is not the last word. God will not be silenced even in the face of humanity's ultimate enemy, death. Psalm 118 is traditionally read on Palm Sunday. And in it, we find the words that the people of Jerusalem shout to Jesus as he enters the city. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the, of the Lord. There's more good news in that psalm, especially in a week like this, a week where we move from Hosanna to crucify him. It reads, give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. Let Israel say it, God's love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say it, God's love endures forever. Let those who honor the Lord say it, God's love endures forever. In tight circumstances, I cried out to the Lord. The Lord answered me with wide open spaces. The Lord is for me. I won't be afraid. What can anyone do to me? I thank you because you answered me, because you were my saving help. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. For you are my God. I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will lift you up high. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good. God's love endures forever. In weeks like these, God's love endures forever. Even when we claim a desperate need for Jesus only to reject him, God's love endures forever. Even when we cry out over and over, save us only to walk away from Jesus, God's love endures forever. It is news so good that the psalmist gives everyone a chance to say it. He says, let Israel say it. God's love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say it. God's love endures forever. Let those who honor the Lord say it. God's love endures forever. So let all of us gathered here now online together Say it, say it with me. God's love endures forever. When you find yourself in the darkest valley, come on church, say it again with me. God's love endures forever. When you failed to love God with your whole lives and failed to love your neighbor as yourself, a little bit louder sisters and brothers, say it with me. God's love endures forever. Even when our shouts of Hosanna have become chants of crucify him, don't say it, shout it. God's love endures forever. And even when it's Friday and all feels lost, God's love endures forever. Amen.